Hello and welcome to the first Smithsonian Education Online Conference. And our conference today and tomorrow is on the life and legacy of Abraham Lincoln. We are delighted to have people from all across the nation and in fact all around the world joining together to celebrate and to better understand the life of this uh, very important figure in the history of the United States. We have an incredible lineup for you today. Uh, we have people coming to you from a variety of different Smithsonian Institution units or museums and centers and initiatives who are going to offer different perspectives, not only on Abraham Lincoln, but how to appreciate what he has to offer us in our classrooms as we learn about har art and history and, in fact, even science. So it's going to be a, a wonderful two days. What's very important during these couple of days is your interaction. We want to hear from you. We want you to share your ideas, and we'll be giving you many opportunities to do so. My name is Jonathan Finkelstein, and I'll be your host for the next couple of days. So you can certainly give me some input and feedback as we go along so we can best uh, best uh, serve your needs and, and foster the kind of interactivity that you're looking for during these sessions. We'll be opening up the floor in just a moment to Pam Henson and Courtney Esposito, uh, who are from the uh, Smithsonian Institution Archives. But before we do so, I wanted just to point out a box on the left side of your screen. It says Chat Q&A. And it's in that box where you can enter questions or comments throughout the session. So feel free to do that if you have a question. We'll do our best to integrate your questions in as we go along. But of course, we have many people participating in a limited amount of time. So I will also point out as we wrap things up uh, where you can go to continue the dialogue that starts during the session. That's in fact what these sessions are all about, which is starting a dialogue on these topics. So before we uh, go any further, let me also point out if you should need any technical assistance, you can write to the email address on your screen or click on it as needed. It's help at learningtimes.net. And uh, we are, of course, recording all of the sessions throughout the next two days. So if you need to jump off to teach a class or do anything else, you'll know that you can always come back and view the recording. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is actually two speakers. <laughs> um, we have Pam Henson, who is the Director of Institutional History Division at the Smithsonian Institution Archives, and she'll shortly introduce Courtney Esposito, her colleague, as well. So I'll turn the floor over to them. Pam. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first online conference. Uh, what I'd like to do today is introduce you to some of the Smithsonian's primary sources and talk about how to use them in your classroom. Uh, and it's going to be uh, things focusing, of course, on Lincoln. Uh, and uh, what I'd like to do is start with a little quote that we have here from Mary Henry's diary on April, on April 15, 1865. We were awakened this morning by an announcement which made our hearts stand still with consternation. The president was shot last night in the theater. And this is from a diary that we actually have in Smithsonian Institution Archives. So this morning, we're going to talk about those fateful days and the types of evidence we have to learn about uh, those days, their impact on people, and how people learned about them and thought about them. Uh, we, uh, this is an image of the diary that you can see that we have here in the archives and some of the pages from it. And we have all of the, the excerpts from this diary available um, on the resources section in the exhibit hall. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm director of the Institutional History Division in Smithsonian Institution Archives. That means I'm the historian for the history of the Smithsonian. I've been here since 1973. And I get to work every day with a wide range of primary sources archival materials. And with me today is Courtney Esposito. You tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Pam's program assistant at the Institutional History Division. And um, I just came on recently and have enjoyed working with the materials and coming up with online exhibits and way to get these materials out to teachers throughout the United States and the world. So as we move into our materials today, um, I want to talk a little bit about the resources that we have at Smithsonian Institution Archives. As I mentioned, we have these things available in the Resource Center. And any of the items from Smithsonian Institution Archives, documents, images, things like that, can be downloaded and reproduced and used in your classroom without permission. Uh, we want you to use them. We are going to look at some news clippings and images from other sources. To use them, you'd have to request permission from that organization, such as the Chicago Historical Society. Society. Um, and now we'd just sort of like to ask some questions about you. Please tell me uh, in the little poll box what would best describe you. Are you a uh, 
K through six, seven through nine, uh, ten through twelve teacher, a library media specialist, or other. So tell me a little bit about uh, what this group is, so we have some sense of what your interests are. And by the way, Pam, um, if you, as we're noting, a number of people are choosing the other category, we'd love to know what that is. Feel free to use the chat box on the left and tell us what other thing you do or yes. teach. So we can have some idea of your backgrounds as well. Because we actually have more than half of you are other. Uh, and I, we see in our registration some of you come from uh, archives, some of you come from museum backgrounds, uh, some of you are history buffs, uh, education and exhibit people. Um, and uh, I think these are things that will be of interest to you as well. All right. Now, um, I'd like to actually ask you another question about yourself, and that is, what is your subject area interest? Are you interested in social studies, English, math, science, foreign language, art, or other? And we'll expand this beyond teaching, because we know a, lot, yeah. a number of you are not teachers, so you can just indicate areas of interest as well. Yeah. Um, and what we're seeing is a lot of social studies people, but some English, math, science, art, uh, and other. Uh, Things like instructional technology, which I think uh, we'll be addressing that for our English teachers. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how uh, this applies to you as well. And yes, do any of you uh, teach ad history advanced placement uh, test preparation courses? I'm, I'm wondering because materials like these um, are really important for um, document the document-based questions that students often use uh, in history advanced placement. Not a lot of you, but some of you, uh, which is good to see. Okay. Um, I'd also like to know how many of you, if you do teach, have used primary sources in your classroom, or if you do other types of work, um, do you use primary sources uh, in your work and the things that you do? The vast majority of yeah. our group does. Yeah, so many of you are, really do have good experience with primary sources. Now, I have another question for you is, how would you define primary sources? And I'd like you to sort of fill in the pop-up box and give us some ideas of what you think a primary source is so we can talk about this a little bit. So on the left side of your screen right now, there's a small box. Uh, and there's an even smaller box at the bottom of that where you can enter your cursor and type. So what would your definition of a primary source be? And you don't need to use complete sentences here, uh, just a short phrase or description or even one word. And Jessica, thank you for being the first to mm -hmm. uh, submit your response. And others are following in. So we have anything that's taken from a first-person account an original document. Uh, Kimberly uh, and others are talking about old books or maps or letters. Original documents. We've got some very good responses here. Um, Someone saying all of the above? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. I, I, we've got some very, very good examples here. Um, original materials uh, created at the time of the event, uh, things like that. Great. Everyday objects, photos, artwork. So let's move on to the next slide. All right. Okay. And we'll just take those up. We'll, we'll give you more opportunities to, to share ideas. So we'll bring those boxes. And back. very similar, many of you, to, to my definition that I tend to use, which is any original source of information that provides a direct or first person connection to a historical event. So I think we're, we're very much uh, in agreement as, as to what this is going to be. Uh, I've got another question for you here. Can you give me some examples of primary sources, what you think they would be? All right. So on the left again, you can type. Letters, absolutely. Diaries, newspaper accounts, uh, photographs, political posters speeches, uh, so voice recordings, yeah, voice recordings, uh, objects by artists, maps, interviews, clothing, town hall meeting minutes. These are probably all things that vary of you. Notebooks, artifacts, absolutely. Legal deeds, very much so. Paintings, prints, letters, 
So yes, these are all really, really good examples of uh, things, videotapes, things like that, um, that are primary sources when they have a connection uh, to the past. So yes, very much so. Music as well um, can be census reports. Uh, these are all really, I think, excellent examples of um, things that are primary sources. In the next slide, I put together a little list um, of things that I think about, documents such as letters, diaries, birth certificates, receipts, notebooks, images such as a photograph, painting, or map, objects such as clothing or furnishing. It can be equipment people use in their work, and testimony such as oral history interviews. Some of you mentioned speeches, but also other sound things like music, uh, all sorts of things like that from um, the past. Now, I'm very interested in primary sources because they have this first-hand relationship to historical events. Secondary sources, as most of us know, are summaries. They're second-hand or third-hand accounts, analyses of the past. But one of the hard things when we use these in the classroom is that there are many shades of gray with primary sources. And there are degrees of being a primary source. And one source can contain both primary and secondary information. Um, it can be both. Um, and uh, this can be hard for students um, to figure out. But for example, a textbook could contain a facsimile of a primary source. So the textbook is kind of a secondary source, but it has a primary source in it. Um, we could have a letter that looks like a primary source, but somebody might re be reporting information that they heard third or fourth hand. It's really hearsay. So you can have second, you know, secondhand information in your primary source. The other thing that's very important for students to understand is that whether it's primary or secondary really may depend upon the question that you're asking. Even with that textbook that is a secondary source in many ways, but has primary sources in it, if my question is, how was uh, social studies taught in the United States in the 20th century, that textbook then becomes a primary source for that question. Um, so it can be complex, and this can be hard for students to understand, but I think it also makes it much more interesting. The other fun part, I think, is that primary sources very often contain conflicting information that has to be resolved, unlike textbooks that sort of tell you what the final agreed upon story is. But I think it really turns students into detectives and really engages them in the historical process uh, and lets them really uh, get involved in trying to figure out what went on in this historical event. Now, why would you use them in the classroom? Uh, I think they really uh, speak to you in a first-person voice. They give you a, really an individual's view of historic events and times. They bring history alive. And for someone like Lincoln, I think they bring heroes to life as real people, not these kind of mythic figures or almost cartoonish figures that aren't real. And also, I think they tell stories about how people lived and how people coped in the past, which is, I think, very important for students to learn. Uh, for the curriculum, I think that they really can improve reading comprehension and literacy skills because these are engaging stories that students want to read. They can enhance vocabulary. People speak differently in uh, earlier times. They can also develop observation and visual analysis skills. And I think that's very important uh, for students to really learn to look at things and visually analyze them. Um, and they can, in the older students, they can really develop critical skills. When you ask these students to compare and evaluate things like point of view and information, and then develop life skills, students can learn from how people dealt with the past. I do see that we do have a quick question that um, Sheila had asked, will students be able to view some Abe's artifacts? Just stick with the presentation, and we'll see tons of them coming up. Right. Well, we're mostly going to have documents and photographs. Some of our later sessions will actually mm -hmm. have um, artifacts as well. Um, let's see. Go to our next slide here. Now, to gain access to these, as I mentioned, um, we have made a lot of these available in our exhibit hall. The internet has many facsimiles of primary sources. Please use them with care. Start with a very trusted educational site. 
And I have a handout in the Resource Center with the links to these organizations, which I consider some of the best for you to start with. Obviously, the Smithsonian, the American Memory site of the Library of Congress, the History Matters site, Ed Siteman, which is the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Digital Classroom at the National Archives. But there are also primary sources all around you. Your students have photographs. They have family diaries. Uh, they have um, family Bibles, things like that, that they can bring in. So you can actually ask your students to bring things uh, into the classroom as well. Now, when students have these primary sources, how do you go about analyzing them, especially if there's confusing information? And the first thing that I say is, um, is this document or photograph a primary source? That's kind of your first question. And so you say to yourself, as many of you said, does it have this first person eyewitness participant relationship? If not, does it have other historical value? Even if it's not first person, is it still historically revealing? Then to analyze them, I want to say, well, who created this document or this object? Where or when was it created? Very important, why was this created? Who was the intended audience? And what was their point of view? Um, and sort of my classic example for this is, let's say we have a letter that a student writes about their uh, spring break trip. Why did they create it? Well, one of the letters that they're writing is to a high school friend talking about the trip. And the other is a letter to their parents talking about the trip. They have two different intended audiences, and I think two different points of view and two different reasons for creating it. And so the information in those two letters, I think, is, although it's about the same trip, may be somewhat different for a lot of students. And we have to ask, who are they writing this for? Why are they writing it? And think a little bit about who they're talking to when they create it, who they think is going to see it or use it. Now. What I found is that conflicts in primary, secondary sources are really not unusual. And some of the techniques that I use to resolve these is I use the concept of reliability. Is this diary internally consistent? Or does this person somehow or other seem to use things or say things that don't line up with one another? So I think this isn't a very reliable witness. If they are internally consistent, then I want to compare it with other sources. Are they consistent with other accounts or other things that I know about that event? Then I ask about, what is this point of view? What is this motivation? Why is this person writing this letter? I want to know if this is a first person account, a second hand account. Is it hearsay, perhaps? Is there any physical evidence that we have that would corroborate or um, disagree with what this person is saying. And then, as in the courtroom, when you're trying to draw your conclusions, very often the preponderance of evidence is what helps you decide uh, what you're going to conclude about this. So let's actually look at this Mary Henry diary that we have here um, and look in a little bit more detail about what she says and who she is. Mary Henry lived from 1834 to 1903. She was the daughter of Joseph Henry, who was the first secretary of the Smithsonian. And she kept a very detailed diary during the Civil War years. I think she understood the historical importance of that time period. She lived in what is called the Smithsonian Castle or Smithsonian Institution Building, which is now on the Mall in Washington. Um, and this is, uh, we have some pictures of Mary with her family outside of the Smithsonian building. The right hand photo is at the east door of the castle. This is taken in 1865. Um, and we do even have some images of the interior of their home. Uh, these are, for those of you wondering about them, uh, stereopticon photographs. And you'll see, you can see repetitions in parts of them, especially the bottom right photograph. And people took two views of an interior. You viewed them with a stereopticon viewer, and you got kind of a 3D image um, back then, sort of like we do with the glasses today. And as you can see, the Smithsonian uh, Castle was actually not very close to downtown, although the Smithsonian is sort of prime real estate now. Back in the 19th century, it really was sort of out in the middle of nowhere. There was a canal, that white line that you can see in front of the building. 
was actually a canal that cut us off from downtown. You had to go way out of your way to get to downtown. So it was not a prime location. Um, but it was within the city, and they very much knew what was going on. Let's go to our next slide. Her father, Joseph Henry, was the first secretary of the Smithsonian. He was a physicist, and he served as a science advisor to President Lincoln during the Civil War. And he helped the Army and Lincoln decide things about sing signaling mechanisms, munitions, balloons for reconnaissance, things like that. So the Henrys, the family socialized with the Lincoln family. So they knew Lincoln personally. They knew his family. They dined at the White House. They saw the Lincoln family at official events in Washington. Um, and to answer the question we have up here, yes, they, the painter Peel, who's Charles Wilson Peel, are these photos taken by a relative? They were taken by his son, Titian Ramsey Peel. Um, and Lincoln actually visited Joseph Henry at the Smithsonian Castle. They would go up to the top tower and test different types of signaling lights um, to see which would work best for the military uh, during the Civil War. So the Henrys knew the Lincolns. This was a personal relationship. If we look then at the diary and what Mary says that day, uh, we see how Lincoln's death affected her personally. She says, we were awakened this morning by an announcement which almost made our hearts stand still with consternation. The president was shot last night in the theater. When the morning paper was issued, he was still alive, although little or no hopes were entertained of his recovery. But now the tolling bell tells us he has ceased to breathe. He is dead. Mr. DeBus has just told Hannah that he died at half seven o'clock. Deeply must the country mourn this death, for though uncouth and ungainly, he was true-hearted, magnanimous, and kind, and in the present crisis ready to follow such a course with the defeated belligerents as would win them back to their allegiance to the government and subdue the rebellion in their hearts, as well as subjugate their aims. The South has lost in him uh, a good and judicious friend. And Mary is in her mid-30s when she's writing this. Um, so she is an adult, uh, and she is quite a writer. She reflects uh, in very uh, sort of somber ways on a lot of events that go on during the Civil War. Now, I'd like to ask you all, do you think this diary entry is a primary source? And we're going to go ahead and bring up uh a box for you with a little poll on the left, so let us know. You can click yes or no. And we have a uh, the question, what is half 7 o'clock? Is it 7.30? Yes. Uh, this is a 19th century way of saying it. Um, and this is one of the things where I was saying people can learn uh, different types of language and uh, learn to really listen to language when they um, hear language that isn't used the same way that we use it today. And we'll show you the results of your of your responses here. Most of you think it is. Uh, some of you say yes and no. Uh, some of you think it's not a first-hand account. Some of you do. And uh, we have a good one here. It's not a primary source of his actual death, but is a primary source for how people responded at the time. And I think that. Uh, she was not in attendance, but she is telling us how people were reacting at the time. So if our question is, how did people react to Lincoln's death? How did they hear about Lincoln's death? Absolutely. So it's a primary source of her mood and her point of view of how she experienced Lincoln's death, um, but it, it was not she was not present at, his, at the shooting and at the murder, I mean, at his death. So yes, it is a, a very complex uh, case. Um, and we're going to look at a variety of um, primary sources surrounding Lincoln's death. There's a lot of confusion uh, during his, um, the immediate moments after his shooting. 
And then very quickly thereafter, there's a lot of popular culture that's produced. Um, and this image you see is a very popular Courier and Ives lithograph, widely distributed. And if you go to the Library of Congress American Memory site, you can see copies of this they have available there. Um, so we can look at these. Um, and we immediately, the newspaper started putting out all sorts of um, accounts of Lincoln's death. Um, and this is uh, another account, spe special dispatch to the New York Times. And things like this, your library media specialist can probably go to ProQuest historical newspapers where they've digitized these newspapers and get a copy for you. Uh, we can't give you further reproduction, but um, you could there. And here we see this initial newspaper account at 11.15 p.m. People know that the president has been shot. He is still alive. Uh, if we go to the middle of the page, uh, we see that they say the president's wound is reported mortal. He was at once taken into the house opposite the, the theater. As if this horror was not as enough, Almost the same moment, the story ran through the city that Mr. Seward had been murdered in his bed. And they're reporting then after that, and then also that an attempt was also made on the life of Mr. Stanton. And it was also believed that he had been killed by some of the rumors. So we, and then we see Telegram Extra. This is yet another version. Um, if we go see, this is one that was then put out at 1.30 in the morning. So the newspapers are just putting out extra after extra that whole night and the whole next day, um, trying to, um, and they have a little more detail, but they're trying to get information out because everyone wants to know what's going on. Um, and here, uh, this is a telegram that they're reproducing from Edward Stanton, the Secretary of War. Uh, to Major General Dix, and so they're, what the newspaper is trying to do is produce an official account, show that Mr. Stanton is okay, and have an official account out there. Um, and Stanton says, uh, it is hoped the wounds may not be mortal. My apprehension is that they will prove fatal, and that's for Mr. Seward. Um, and th there were, in fact, uh, many uh, account many interviews of witnesses to the account um, and I'm not they are reproduced in various books um, I don't have them available now but it is something that we could look up and see uh, where we could find those accounts but certainly there were hearings and um, lots of things uh, to document all the people that were there uh, the S Frederick Seward was not in fact murdered in his bed he was attacked but, but he did survive, okay? Yes, and uh, so let's look again um, at Mary's diary. Uh, and this is actually a couple of days later, she writes an account because she's now gone uh, to visit her minister, uh, Dr. Gurley. And Dr. Gurley was also Lincoln's minister and he was at his bedside when he died. And he tells Mary, um, that um, he, his, he repeats to her his reminiscences of Lincoln's last moments. And she goes home and writes these down in her diary because she considers this to be so important. Um, and she talks about uh, how, uh, if we look at the middle of the page, she went to Mrs. Lincoln and found her in an almost frantic condition. The the president died about seven and a half o'clock. Dr. Gurley returned to his bedside a few minutes before his decease. He made his way through the sorrowing and silent spectators and found him slowly drawing his breath at long intervals, lying as before, perfectly motionless. A faint, hardly perceptible motion in his throat, and all was over. So still was the room that the ticking of the president's watch was distinctly heard. After a solemn and impressive prayer, Dr. Gurley went to break the sad intelligence to Mrs. Lincoln, who was in the parlor below. She cried out, oh, why did you not tell me he was dying? So we hear her um, copying of Dr. Gurley's account. And uh, this is, again, a complex uh, document. Um, do we have a pop-up for this? 
Uh, I'm not sure if we have one for this one. I'm not sure we do. Yeah, OK. Um, because again, this is a, an interesting combination of primary and secondary sources. Um, it's a second-hand account within something that is a primary source. And it, she was not there. She, she is copying down what was told to her by someone who was there. So it's a second-hand account. But it's also very interesting historically because it tells her how important um, it was to her to know the, the moments of Lincoln's death. This is such an important event. So do you think this is a primary source? Uh, let's see. I'll bring this up for you. We have a little box here. Make it a little, uh, a little bigger there for people. All right, the results are coming in. Hmm. This one's uh, this one's in flux, Pam. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And I, I really do understand that because, again, this is a very complex document. Um, it is, as I said, the diary itself is a primary source. And here is where we move from primary versus secondary and use the concepts of a first-hand account, a second-hand account, a third-hand account, or hearsay. Because this is a primary source, but it is a second-hand account of Lincoln's death. So I think we can, uh, you know, sort of analyze it in that way, not just use the sort of black and white primary source, secondary source, but we, within that primary source, we start to evaluate it as um, how important is this um, as a historical resource. And it is because it has a secondary account, but one very close in time, um, and somebody who was, in fact, present there. Um, so let's move on to our next one, and let's look at some additional information we have about Lincoln's death. And this is a very famous photo uh, taken by one of the um, boarders in the house, uh, Julius Olkey, after Lincoln's body was removed. And this is actually uh, the uh, bedroom where Lincoln died. Um, and this is owned by the Chicago Historical Society. Um, and I will tell you one simple fact. The size of this room is 9.5 feet by 17 feet. So we have some physical evidence about this room as well. If we go to our next slide, um, we see a lithograph that is um, produced that same year. And it's a little bit different in the orientation of the room um, and some of the things in the room. Uh, we see Robert, the son, at the end of the bed with the handkerchief over his face. Uh, and uh, we see Mary Todd Lincoln pictured in the doorway with her son, Tad, and another woman, presumably Clara Harris, who was with them at the theater. And uh, so this is slightly different because Dr. Gurley's account has said that she was downstairs. Now let's look at our next image. And this was one of the most popular images of Lincoln's deathbed, <coughs> produced in 1868, three years later, by Alonzo Ch Chappelle and uh, John Batchelder. This now has a total of 47 people in the room. Uh, we still see some elements, like Robert Lincoln at the end of the bed. The bed is a different orientation here. But we also have Mary Todd Lincoln and presumably Clara Harris and several other women in the room. But I mean, the question that you have to ask, um, and let's look at the next slide. Do you think that all of these people in the third slide could fit in the room that you see um, in the first slide? And we have some polls here and questions that I would like to ask you about this. Um, do you think that this image is a primary source? So let's go ahead. We'll bring up uh, our, Polls. our poll again and find out what you think. The verdict looks pretty clear on this yeah, one. Yeah, most of you think this is a primary source of what the room looked like. So it was taken a very few minutes after uh, Lincoln died. Let's go to our next one. Uh, the next image that we see here. 
the lithograph of the room. So do most of you think that this image is a primary source. And here we have a very different uh, sort of view of whether or not this is a primary source because again, it is it, it it is not as the photograph was something taken immediately at the time. But if we think about our questions that we have here, uh, what if our question is how was Lincoln's death depicted? This would be a primary source, but. If this is a primary source for what did Lincoln's deathbed scene look like, this is an artistic interpretation and it is not as much of a primary source um, that we can do. Uh, can we go to the next one? Okay, and now we have the oil painting of the room um, and do you think this is a primary source? And most of you are saying, Really not. And again, <laughs> this is this is an artistic interpretation. Um, and uh, as some of you are noting, the size of the bed was way too small for Lincoln. In fact, and he's laid out very, you know, sort of uh, comfortably here. But in fact, uh, people like the Secretary of the Navy, who was there, Gideon Wells, say that you know he was he, he, they had to put him sideways across the bed because he really was. Um, too tall to fit on the bed. So this is very much an artistic interpretation and it's not a primary source for what did was going on in the room. But it does tell you it is a primary source for how people felt about Lincoln's death because what we see is if you see the white um, focus on him in the center, he almost is saintly in his appearance. This really is that people felt this was the moment of martyrdom of a great saint of American history. And so it does reveal a lot about what people thought and felt, but it is not an accurate depiction of what the room is because you surely could not figure, uh, fit 47 people um, in that room. Now let's talk a little bit in our polls about how these vary. Um, I have some questions here, see what your observation skills are. Um, do we think that the size of the room varies, the placement of the bed, the number of the people in the room, whether or not Mary Todd Lincoln was in the room? Uh, does this vary from image to image? People are looking across these various images and um, looking, looks like people think these vary in all of the ways you've yeah. listed. Yeah, and they really do. Um, and it, it, we'll talk a little bit about this um, further. Now let's compare these so we see the images vary. Let's go to our next slide and let's go back to Mary Henry's diary uh, and say to ourselves, what did Mary say that could uh, also make us think about this. Um, he says he made his way through the sorrowing and silent spectators and found him slowly uh, drawing his breath. So still was the room that the ticking of the president's watch was distinctly heard. After a solemn and impressive prayer, Dr. Gurley went to break the sad news, sad intelligence to Mrs. Lincoln who was in the parlor below. So according to Mary, the room, there could have been very many people in there because you could actually hear his watch ticking. It was so quiet and Mrs. Lincoln was in the parlor below. In fact, we know if we compare this account with ones of like uh, the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, Mary's account is in fact very accurate. And so we have conflicts in the number of people in the room, whether or not Mrs. Lincoln was in the room, how quiet it could be in that room. Um, so why don't we go to our next slide. So what evidence could we use now that we have um, all of these questions about what was Lincoln's deathbed actually like? Which of these pieces of evidence could we use uh, to resolve this and come to a conclusion about what Lincoln's deathbed was like? Well, we would look at what are the things that are done closest in time. The photograph, for example, is closest. The first lithograph is closest. 
uh, the verbal accounts, the first and second hand accounts, the newspaper accounts, these are all much closer in time than that uh, image produced three years later. Um, we can just say, is this a photograph versus an artistic uh, interpretation? Is this first hand, second hand hearsay? So we can look at a, and evaluate these different pieces of evidence. Go to our next slide. And the other thing that we can do is sort of analyze this image. Um, and this is what historians have come to use call the rubber room phenomenon. And that is that everybody historically wanted to be associated with the martyr's president. Uh, most of the people in this oil painting visited Lincoln between the time he was placed in the room and the time he died. But not all were there at the exact moment of his death. Uh, so it really is a who's who of Washington, D.C. And everyone wants to be associated with the martyred president with this important historical event. So over time, pe more and more people are added in. And this depicts sort of the people associated with Lincoln and who, are, who were there around the time that he died, but it does not depict the exact moment of his death. And we know for certain Mary Lincoln was not in the room when he died. Tad was not in the room. He was back at the White House, things like that. So this is symbolic of who was around Lincoln at the time, but not there at the moment of his death. So um, as I've mentioned, we know from comparison with uh, other accounts that Mary Henry's account is, in fact, very accurate. It, it's also very compatible with the photograph and the earlier images. Um, and while it's not a per first person account, it's a very interesting and accurate secondhand account that I think can engage students and bring the emotions uh, of the day to life. Um, so this is the type of thing that we can uh, use in the classroom. Um, and if we look at uh, descriptions of these images, uh, if you go to the websites that they are, we do know who is every person in every one of those images. That's one of the questions that we've been asked. Um, if you go to uh, them, you'll see everyone is identified. In fact, Chappelle photographed a lot of the people, and, and the Chicago Historical Society has those photographs. Um, and he used those photographs in the paintings, um, including uh, Robert Lincoln, who uh, is at his father's, the foot of his father's bed. And he posed as he would have been uh, that day for that painting. But again, the painting is people who came and went over the time period between uh, Lincoln being shot and his death. Um, so it is an historically interesting account, and we uh, can compare all of these different accounts and then see who was actually there, who was there earlier in the day. Grant came but left uh, very shortly thereafter, as did Johnson. So some people came and went but were not there um, at the moment of death. Now, one of the things that I've done is uh, I often do this as a workshop and separate students into three different groups and have them look at the diary entry, look at different news clippings, and look at the different images. Um, I break them into three separate groups. Each group analyzes one type of evidence. Um, and I come together and um, compare all of these things, have the students discuss them separately, fill out a little sheet about what their conclusions are, and then um, come together again and draw conclusions and resolve conflicts among the types of evidence. So they look at one type of evidence, then they bring all three types of evidence together. And if you go to the resource room, uh, the exhibit hall, the resource section, we have all of the handouts for doing that sort of a workshop uh, in the um, in your own classroom or with your students or pro public programming that you might do. And it can be applied to sort of any set of those. We have a question about how you get these pictures. As I mentioned, they are available from these other organizations like the Library of Congress and Chicago Historical Society. We should mention that, again, in your uh, virtual exhibit area of uh, the online conference site, there is a link to a lovely document that Pam and Courtney have provided that lists the resources and gives you a nice accounting and, uh, on how to conduct right. this lesson. 
All right. Now, one of the things, if we'd like to continue this discussion, um, uh, we don't have a, an answer to a question. We don't have a diary of John Wilkes Booth. Um, what uh, we'd like to see you in the blogging area, um, submit your own ideas, comments of how you might be able to use these in your classroom. Uh, is, is this something you think you could use in the classroom? Um, and if so, how could you use these sorts of things uh, in your classroom? And we'd like to really see the um, teachers sort of start to have a discussion among yourselves and see your own ideas for how you might be able to use things like this in the classroom. Great. And we have a number of questions coming in. OK. Let's uh, talk about these. Uh, here's a question uh, from a few moments ago. The question is, are there any actual documents from, from any of the men present who gave a personal account? That's a question from Beth. Yes. Um, I don't know how readily available it, it is, but um, as I mentioned, the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, um, it did uh, did have a diary account. He went back and wrote in his diary an account of what happened. Dr. Gurley wrote an account. There are a number of accounts of people who were there that day. Not all of them um, are available to teachers, um, and so they may be a little bit harder to track down. Uh, the, and the advantage of the Mary Henry diary is we have digitized it. We have actually transcribed um, what she wrote, because it's often hard for students to read 19th century handwritings, and made that available. Uh, Gary asks, do, do the newspaper accounts themselves give a moment-by-moment -moment timeline? And if so, are they valid? The newspapers are very valid for what the public was learning at the time. but as happened in the news after September 11th or any major event like this, the initial accounts can be very inaccurate. It was reported uh, that Secretary Seward um, had been killed um, and his son. They both did survive. And it had been reported that the Vice President had been killed, that Stanton had been attacked and was perhaps dead. So there were rumors all over the city of Washington. And these were being telegraphed around the country. And um, I think that they're very interesting in seeing um, how people react and teaching students about how could they critically evaluate information that comes out in a crisis like this. Um, because they learned then, after an event like September 11th, to understand something terrible has happened, but also have a little bit of criticism, a little critical eye as they're listening, um, and uh, to understand that not all the information that comes out in a time of crisis and goes out in the news is correct. Uh, an interesting observation came in from Lorraine at Coffee High School. She says, I'm reluctant to admit that I've never given much thought to Lincoln on his deathbed. He was assassinated, end of story. So I thought, how fascinating that we have these artistic interpretations among the other texts, texts of his final moments. That's because you are a 21st century person. In the 19th century, um, Lincoln's deathbed, the reproductions of that oil painting and those lithographs were found in homes all over the country. This was such a historically important event, the martyred president, um, that this was most people were familiar with one or another of those images in the 19th century and knew the accounts of Lincoln's death. We have a number of uh, comments and thoughts being shared here, and we want to thank everyone for doing so. We have just about a minute to go before mm -hmm. we take a brief break and then return with uh, Harry Rubenstein from the uh, National Museum of American History in just a few minutes. Uh, but please do continue to share. Let's see if we have time for uh, one more question as well. And we also have a number of students who are sharing some of their thoughts, uh, and we thank you for doing so. Someone asked about the bloodstained pillow. That all of those things are available at the Chicago Historical Society, and they have been verified as uh, the artifacts coming from that home. There's a number of questions uh, about John Wilkes Booth. Um, 
Uh, I know we'll be talking ab about the assassination in a couple of the other sessions, but there's some curiosity about whether it's true that uh, he had, if he had ever slept in the same bed in which Lincoln died. And I, I don't know the answer to that. What I can tell you is that the Ford's Theater has just been renovated and will be reopening to the public on February 17th and they are redoing their websites and everything else and they are a wonderful resource uh, either to visit in Washington or to go to their website and look what the National Park Service has made available um, on that website. The Chicago Historical Society also has a tremendous amount of additional information that you can go to uh, for details about the assassination and the time at the end. Great. All right. Well, we want to thank everyone for joining us. And Pam and Courtney, thank you for kicking off our online conference with such a fascinating look um, at uh, the death of the president, but also teaching us some really important skills that I think will help us in the rest of the sessions as we look at objects and content that's going to be shared with us by our subsequent speakers. And thank you for joining us today. Thank you. We'll be back in just under 10 minutes with our next session.